Get Healthy Cincinnati from the Christ Hospital Health Network and these local partners. I am Michael Krinas. I am a gastroenterologist in private practice with Ohio GI, and I'm the gastroenterology section chief at the Christ Hospital of Cincinnati. Digestive health is so important to your overall health because the digestive system we consider to be the soul of the body. It regulates things, it controls us. Think about how well you feel if you eat well. Think about how poorly you feel if you don't eat well. The digestive system nourishes the entire body. So without proper nourishment, without proper metabolism, we don't have health, we don't have healing, we don't have energy. So the digestive system is, is so important. And you know, there's a rhythm to the, to the digestive system. There's a reason people eat three times a day. It's because we feel better. It's not because someone said some time ago, you must eat three meals a day. It's because we just determined on our own. We felt there's a certain rhythm going on that when you eat properly, you feel better. So a lot of people skip meals and that's not necessarily so healthy. If they were to try to eat more regularly to nourish themselves on a regular basis, they would generally feel better and do so with quality foods. There are many things a person can do to maintain good digestive health. A lot of it, I must say, is common sense. Ignore the commercials on TV. Ignore the places you drive by on a daily basis that beckon you to come in and enjoy the wonderful things that they have to offer. You can do for your digestive health, it really starts with several things. Eating properly, eating regularly, eating the right foods, trying to avoid the wrong foods. And I don't necessarily mean being totally strict. We should all absolutely enjoy ourselves. I think we should enjoy ourselves all the time, but not necessarily with every meal and not necessarily make each meal total enjoyment. In other words, I recommend to people, and we practice this ourselves, eating healthy, eating a high fiber diet. So if you're going to have a sandwich, have, don't have that white bread that really has very little nutritional value, get some good wheat bread. You can toast it if you like, it makes it taste better. Have that bread. There's no reason to avoid bread. Bread, bread can be wonderful on a sandwich. If you're going to eat meat, Enjoy the meat, but try to make it lean meat. Cut the fat off. If you have chicken, take that fatty part of the skin off. Let's try to avoid fried foods, and let's try to avoid a lot of these fast foods. Some of the fast food chains are trying to get better now by uh, giving us capabilities on menu items that will be healthier, but even still, you're not gonna do nearly as well as you, if you prepare it yourself. It's gonna be less additives, less fat, less sugar. Calories are a problem for people, of course. America is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's a large part because of the caloric content that we have. I'm not gonna point any fingers at certain types of sugars or fats, but you have to put it all together and make a plan for yourself that you're not gonna eat so much in the way of high sugar items, high fat items. Enjoy things, but just make them, make them sensible. So eat three meals a day, try to eat low fat foods, try to eat high fiber foods, try to eat nutritious foods, try to eat fresh foods. So at what point should you talk to your doctor about your digestive tract or issues or concerns you might have about that? Well, we all have problems from time to time. You've probably all seen the commercials. The guy's sitting down at a restaurant with his wife, he's wanting to have that bowl of chili, and he says, I can't because every time I do, I get heartburn or stomach ache. And she says, no problem, take this pill and you can have whatever you want. It's kind of the American way. So that kind of thing is very common, occasional heartburn, occasional stomach aches from chili or many other things, of course. But it's a problem when you should, and you should talk to your doctor if it's, meaning if it's an ongoing problem, it's really affecting your quality of life, it's bothering you a lot, or if it's getting worse, or if it's associated with other problems. For example, people have problems in the esophagus, they have heartburn. If there's ongoing acid reflux in the esophagus, that can actually cause inflammation and scarring. The esophagus can start narrowing, and then people, when they swallow, they start noticing things get stuck on the way down. That's something you should definitely talk to your doctor about. If you're having heartburn problems that keep going on, that a little antacid's not relieving, you should talk to your doctor about it. If your appetite's not good, if you're losing your appetite and you're losing weight because you're not eating properly, you should talk to your doctor. If you have abdominal pain that's from time to time, that's usually not a big deal, but if it's ongoing, persistent, or progressive, or if it wakes you up at night particularly, that's something you should be talking to your doctor about. If you're having bowel problems, Normally, let's say you have a certain bowel pattern, and there's a lot of variation in what we consider normal. Your mom says, you got to have a bowel movement every morning. That's not necessarily true. Some people go once a week, some people go several times a day, and that's their normal. But whatever your normal is, if that changes, that's something you should be talking to your doctor about. If there's urgency, if you have to rush to the bathroom and that's not usual for you, that's something you should be talking to your doctor about. 
If there's blood in your stool, you're going to talk to your doctor. So this and many other items uh, would be a suggested list of things to make sure you talk to your doctor. And really, if you're not feeling well, you should talk to your doctor. The number of people that are affected by digestive problems is enormous. In fact, the majority of people do have stomach issues, gastrointestinal issues, either at some point in their life or as an ongoing basis. There are two main things I'd point to that are very, very common. One is acid reflux. So the majority of Americans experience acid reflux from time to time, and it's getting more and more of a prevalent problem because one of the main things that can exacerbate or worsen reflux is obesity. And America is growing. Every year we get bigger and bigger, and that leads people to have a lot more problems with acid reflux. Think about the economics for a minute. You, you can't turn the TV on now without seeing commercials for all these acid reflux medications. Why are they advertising it? Because they sell billions of dollars worth of medications because so many people need these medications. So acid reflux is a huge uh, problem, getting more significant, and there are complications of having acid reflux. People can develop esophageal cancer. It is rarer, but esophageal cancer tends to occur in people that have problems with reflux. So we pay attention when our patients tell us they have reflux. We, we often will do an endoscopy if people are having ongoing problems. That's an endoscopy is a, taking a scope while the patient is sedated and looking down there and seeing what the situation is. Is there a bad inflammation? Are there changes that might become cancerous, other issues like that? So acid reflux needs to be uh, addressed. We need to eat properly, try to maintain our weight, not drink too much caffeine, not drink too much alcohol, things like this that certainly can help. The other uh, issue that is very common in America that millions of people suffer from is something called irritable bowel syndrome. Now, irritable bowel syndrome is a myriad of symptoms but tends to be a symptom complex that involves abdominal pain, abdominal bloating, abdominal swelling, tends to come and go, and tend to have bowel irregularities with it. So either too many bowel movements, having diarrhea, too few bowel movements, having constipation, or back and forth, alternating constipation and diarrhea. And the pain often goes along with that, and after they have a bowel movement, the pain often is improved. Irritable bowel is very common, and you might have experienced it yourself. For example, if you've been in school and you had an exam, and maybe you didn't study so well for it like you wanted to, or you're a little nervous about it, you get up in the morning and you're having cramps and you can't get off the bathroom because that's really a form of irritable bowel. Now we say irritable bowel syndrome when that kind of problem is an ongoing issue, people have recurring problems. So that's something you certainly could talk to your doctor about. We have different ways to look at that. There are some people who have issues with too many bacteria in their, in their gut. We call that small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So we now have a, a cause for some people that have irritable bowel, we actually treat this with a certain antibiotic. So that's something fairly new that a lot of people are not aware of. And if you suffer from irritable bowel, you should talk to your doctor about maybe looking into this. We can maybe treat this. There's something else called the mind-gut axis, where there are hormones that are released in the brain that go into the bloodstream and have receptors in the gut, stimulate those receptors, and cause the gut to do a variety of things, like secrete or to spasm or to contract. And that then causes bowel movements or lack of bowel movements, pain, cramps, bloating. So there's a number of ways that we address this. So common, yes, and the two main ones really would be acid reflux and irritable bowel syndrome. There are many other digestive issues as well that we, that we treat and discuss, liver issues, pancreas issues, inflammatory issues, ulcers, I mean, there's many more, but those are the very, very common ones. Uh, there are a variety of over-the-counter medications that are available to treat gastrointestinal illnesses. The main ones really are the acid-blocking medications, so the people that have heartburn or stomach aches from time to time can go to the pharmacy and buy either antacid pills that neutralize, like baking soda, which doesn't work as well, it causes gas, but uh, other antacids. And then there's more medication forms, the H2 blockers that have been around for a long time, the Zantac and Pepsids of the world, and more recently, we call the proton pump inhibitors, like the purple pill, Prilosec. We're not gonna advertise for anybody now, of course, but those are all very well commercialized and you see them uh, over the counter now in the pharmacy. If people are having occasional problems, it's probably fine for them to take them. And if they're not having other complicated issues, so if you have a occasional heartburn, occasional abdominal pain, you take this from time to time. If you're somebody that wants to eat that hot spicy food and you know that every time you do it, it causes you burning or discomfort, it's probably reasonable to take something so you can enjoy yourself, and that's, that's probably fine. But if things are going on, progressive symptoms, uh, not getting better for these medications, you're having to take them all the time, you're not eating well, you're losing weight, you're having other bowel issues, you need to talk to your doctor. So when you read on the package insert that comes with these, many of them will say, take it for no more than two weeks. And that's because 
if you need to take it for more than two weeks, it's really a sign or a signal that they're telling you that you probably should be talking to your doctor. And this comes into play a little bit too because when we prescribe these medications as a prescription after you've seen us, then people call and say, well, the package says you can only take it for two weeks. Do I have to stop? That's really only if you're not under a doctor's care. So that those things are available for acid relief. And there's a variety of things also available for nonspecific relief, anti-gas products, digestive enzymes, and probiotics. Now these are all very interesting, so let's talk about the anti-gas ones first. People suffering from gas and bloating and flatulence, passing gas, can certainly try some of the over-the-counter gas products. They're effective for some and not effective for others. Um, digestive enzymes um, are becoming popular as well. And these, you're, so in the body, your pancreas makes most of the digestive enzymes that we use. And unless you have pancreas problems, most people really do not need to take a supplement that has digestive enzymes. So we'll leave that at that. The final thing is probiotics. Now probiotics are very interesting. In everyone's body, we have t trillions and gazillions of bacteria that normally live in our colon, in our gut. And they live symbiotically with us, which means they live in harmony with us. Now, if there's a perturbation or an alteration in those bacteria, that might affect your digestive health and give you symptoms. So if you get more of the bad bacteria and less of the good bacteria, you might start having problems with bowel issues, bloating, pain. So you can try on your own taking a probiotic. Now there are many, many probiotics, starting with the yogurt, which really is a probiotic. There's some name brand yogurts that are out there that are, in my opinion, not all that effective. And then there are probiotic pills that you can buy. Now you can go to any pharmacy, or health food store, you can find a myriad shelves of these things. The problem with some of them is that the quality control for some of these over-the-counter products that you, we don't even know where they come from is not so good. So that you might have one pill, you might have some live bacteria, because that's what these are, and in the next pill in that same bottle, you might have a larger dose. So there's a little bit of inconsistency there. And the research there is ongoing, very exciting, but we have not determined which is the best probiotic yet. Oh, well, there are a few that we do have some research with that we can talk to you about to give you some, some direction. So again, probiotics are actually taking pills that have live bacteria in them, and hopefully the good ones that might restore your digestive health. So those, those are some examples of over-the-counter products and how we can use them uh, to maintain our health. Brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network, 5WLWT, and The Inquirer.